Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Eddie Shapiro, author of Nothing Like a Date, Conversations of the Great Women of Hollywood. I didn't know that was going to happen. That was an abrupt. Hi. Um, it's so exciting. This is really exciting to be here and the panel of people you're about to see. Um, this book by Bill Madison, um, obviously you're all here because you love Madeline Kahn. We all love Madeline Kahn. And um, uh, Bill's love of Madeline Kahn it was tremendous enough to bring this. Um, but Bill uh, has a um, background in news. Um, he worked with Dan Rather at CBS News. And that fact is evident in every page of this book because it is so, so meticulously researched. Um, he spoke to, over the course of five years, over 300 people um, who had worked with Madeline at, at some juncture in her life. So even though we have a, uh, a panel that's about to come out here uh, that really displays the breadth of her career, it is a mere drop in the ocean of the people who participated uh, in this book. Um, but I do want to bring them all out. Of course, our author, Bill Madison. So <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we also have Michael Carm, who starred with Madeline on Broadway in Two by Two in 1970, the Richard Rodgers musical, which acting coach for many years. Um, uh, Sybil Shepherd, um, who was in the uh, musical At Long Last Love with Madeline Kahn. She brought her own copy. I to make sure you all know what it looks like. Conveniently on sale downstairs. And Sybil will tell you that's the Definitor's Director's Cut. Um, and speaking of the Definitive Director's Cut, we have the Definitive Director of At Long Last Love, uh, Peter Bogdanovich. Who will be joining us in a moment. Okay. He'll be joining us in a moment. Uh, and, but another fabulous director, Robert Allen Ackerman, who directed Madeline in two plays at the Santa Fe Festival Theater. Representing Madeline's television work is the man who directed every single episode of her first series, O Madeline, J.D. LeBeau. <laughs> Julie Dredson was in the Sisters Rosenzweig with Madeline on Broadway. And Maris Clement was in On the 20th Century with Madeline on Broadway. And with one exception, who will be with us any second now? Uh, that's, that's the gang's all here. Um, well, fantastic. Um, so, <laughs> right? Um, so first, you know, um, I need to ask you, Bill, um, as I said, when we were uh, just gathering, that everybody's here loves Madeline, um, but obviously you love her enough to have chosen to write a book. Why? Well, one of the reasons, and I'm not kissing up to the panel, uh, <laughs> she worked with most of the great talents of her time. Uh, and as I say, it's everybody from Leonard Bernstein to the Muppets, which just about covers it. Uh, beyond that, I felt that uh, her background and mine overlapped in really interesting ways. Uh, she had an opera, and oh, by the way, Peter Bogdanovich. Peter Bogdanovich. Yeah. <laughs> so Madeline had a background uh, in opera. I have a background in opera. Madeline had a background uh, at CBS Television. I have a background at CBS Television. I worked in a really crummy. Uh, supporting uh, job, not even a part, uh, on Broadway. She worked on Broadway. And if, <laughs> if anybody wants me for the movies, I would love to do that too. So we had a pretty good overlap of background. Um, you uh, had told me at one point that anytime you mentioned to people uh, that you were working on this book, their eyes sort of went wide and they got kind of giddy. Um, why do you suppose it is that 16 years after her death, Madeline still resonates the way she does? Well, I should say they didn't just get giddy, they levi levitated. Uh, you could, it was a measurable distance from the ground. Uh, one reason I think is that she left us so young, and we are not ready to let go of her. I have found that people 
want to share their memories of her, and people who read the book want to share her. Uh, we want to keep her with us some way. Uh, and that's been a really tremendous experience for me to witness that she's still with us. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, something mm -hmm. in uh, your book that, that struck me as a constant through line and really touches every aspect of her career, which all of these people will speak to, there were two things that, um, that really connected to everything. Um, one is music. Um, yes. And of course, you called the book um, being the music, a life. Um, can you explain the title a little bit? Well, very quickly, uh, on a couple of occasions, but notably in a conversation with Alan Arkin, he said, there are so many things you could do, what was it you set out to do? And her answer was, I wanted to be the music, um, which is such a Madeline thing to say and such a Madeline way to say it. Uh, but the more I learned about her, the more I understood that's exactly what she was trying to do. She sang every script she read, uh, and she moved like music, she lived like music, that was what she was after. So. The other constant um, that was uh, throughout her life and career was her mother Paula, and I think you're the only person um, here who can <laughs> speak to that, so I, yeah, uh, there's a face. <laughs> Well, actually, Michael Carm probably spent a lot more time with Paula than I did and probably had to listen to more about her. Uh, but yeah, I did actually interview Paula uh, before she died, obviously before she died, because that would be ridiculous. Uh, she was uh, extravagant, emotionally unstable, uh, almost certainly mentally ill. Uh, she was a huge influence on Madeline for the good and for the bad. Uh, and she was still trying to manipulate Madeline's story when I met her. She refused really to answer any questions. At the end of our conversation, I said, is there anything you want to say to me uh, before I go? And in a voice that is so much like Madeline's, and she had the same bone structure, Peter, she had that bone structure. Uh, she said, I like you, you're handsome, and I thought, She's kissing up to me because she wants a good report in the book. <laughs> Manipulative to the end. If only she knew. Um, <laughs> she did, honestly. Yeah. She had to know. Yeah. Um, so uh, you did mention, you know, Michael having a, a contact with Paula, probably because more than than others here, because that was the very beginning of her career. Um, Michael, you worked with her in the in the Richard Rogers Martin Sharnan musical Two by Two. Um, which starred Danny Kaye, for those of you who don't know, and just to give you a little bit of um, background on Two by Two, it is the story of Noah and Noah's Ark, um, and uh, Danny Kaye um, had quite the reputation um, for, once he got a little bored with the show, he just sort of went off um, and improvised, much to the chagrin of the other performers on the stage who one by one stopped speaking to him backstage. Um, so it <laughs> made for a rather chilly atmosphere, but within all of that, Here's Madeline Kahn as this sex pot um, uh, and singing her, her, her lungs out um, at, at the very beginning of her career. And also, um, one thing that, that, that uh, really interested me in the book was that her preparation, even then, was stuff that she sort of came up with at home. And, and walked into rehearsal ready, ready to go with, and that sort of stayed with her throughout her career. Can you speak to that? About her? <coughs> well, uh, I, I don't know exactly when we started getting together romantically, uh, maybe a few months after the show, but within the show, uh, I left my wife and the plot of the show, I should say. What? It was the plot of the show. The plot of the show. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that was a Freudian suck. Yeah. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, I left my stage wife, and Madeline came on board the Ark, supposedly to be fixed up with my younger brother, and uh, I was attracted to her. And. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I forgot the, the point because of what I said <laughs> earlier. <laughs> yeah, the preparation. But uh, so we started uh, working on uh, her films together. 
uh, she had her own preparation for the show. And then while we were doing it, <coughs> we would talk about different moments because when we were on stage, uh, Danny, Noah, married us. So for almost a year and a half, we went through a marriage ceremony yeah. on I the know. Ark. Eight times a week. Yeah. Eight, uh, eight shows a week. <laughs> and uh, also when we left the Ark, uh, all the women were pregnant. <laughs> so uh, uh, that was a transition. <laughs> Well, Michael had a big song in the show about how um, frustrated he was. It was called 40 Days and 40 Nights. Um, unfortunately, Danny Kaye thought it was too funny and had it cut. Yeah, that was a, a nightmare. I didn't know it, though. I found out 35 years later that he That's did. a good time to find out. <laughs> well, I did. I found out uh, that way, and uh, uh, it was uh, enlightening to say the least, because I thought I was doing the number poorly, and he rounded up the creators and said he wouldn't go on stage unless the song was cut, because he doesn't follow funny. And that was that particular thing. But Madeline also had a, a wonderful song. Well, she sang an aria after I sang my song. She, did, uh, she sang uh, Huzzah, which was an aria from the Temple of the Golden Ram which is where she was from. And uh, she's, she had a lovely, beautiful song. And Danny was, uh, as many things, he, he wanted part of that song. And then, so he wanted to do that. And then it was cut. Getting married to a person. Getting married to a person. Yeah. Sweet song. Yeah. If any of you want to sing it? <laughs> <laughs> well, that I cast album is it. also for sale downstairs along with the DVD well, and Getting Married Life. to a Person no. is not on the album. Right? No, 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 but the rest of it. Yeah. Um, well, you, uh, your, that's when your relationship with Madeline began and you started coaching her and uh -huh. it's, it's immediately after that, um, after Two by Two, that, that Peter, you met with her um, for her screen debut with What's Up Doc. Um, and I actually had a, my own personal experience with Madeline the, the, uh, the time that I met her. Um, we were working on a benefit for the Drama League and she was speaking to the mic for rehearsal and I was laughing uproariously and she stared at me as if I was out of my mind <laughs> because she could not understand why I could be laughing, what was funny. Um, and apparently that was your same uh, situation with her the first time you met her, that you found her. Exactly. Uh, I was in Los Angeles and the casting person, uh, name I can't remember now, said, why don't you come to New York Nessa and see Himes. a few people? What? Nessa Himes. Nessa Himes, right. And Nessa said, you better come to New York and see a few actors. So I went to New York in a very short time, didn't have time to see two by two. And she came into my office and started talking and I started laughing. <laughs> she said, why are you laughing? I said, you're funny. She said, I am? She didn't know she was funny. And she just had a way of talking. That about 10 minutes after she got there, I said, well, she's going to be the girl, the, uh, the, uh, fian the fiance. And we gave her the part, and it was her first film. Then she came out and did it, and we, I remember we had a reading at the, at the uh, Warner Brothers Stage 5. We had a table read. And everything she said got a laugh. Howard and everybody broke up. <laughs> Streisand was, didn't get one laugh. <laughs> Ryan O'Neill didn't get a laugh. <laughs> Madeline, no matter what she said, oh, laugh. <laughs> <laughs> After it was over, Barbara, Barbara went into a trailer. So she, I went in there and she said, I'm an extra in this goddamn movie. <laughs> an extra. <laughs> but Madeline was very, very funny. She was brilliant. And she didn't know she was funny. In fact, when the picture opened at the music hall, the Ready to the Music Hall, 6,500 people were laughing at her. And she told me she went into therapy. She went to see the movie at the music hall. She said, everybody was laughing. She said, I went into therapy. I said, darling, you're funny. You're never supposed to be laughing. She said, I couldn't handle it. And we did, we did Paper Moon after that, for which she got nominated. And we had a reading of the script. And she had a line that ended with, so what do you say, baby, just for a little while? 
That old Trixie stood up front with her big tits. She got to that line, she said, I'm not gonna say that. I said, what do you wanna say? She said, I don't know, breasts, big ones, something. I said, okay, let it go. The day we shot it, we had two angles on Madeline, only two. One is she comes up the hill, and she says, you like Mickey the Mouse? She falls down, and God damn it, all that, all that stuff is very funny. And then she says, you're gonna ruin it, aren't you? And she, she turns and like she's gonna walk away. And we cut the Tatum, and then we set up a new angle for her when she turns around and says her speech, which ends with, so let Trixie sit up front with her big tits. So I leaned over to her and I said, just before we made the shot, I leaned over, I whispered in her ear, say tits or just say tits. <laughs> Walked away. <laughs> so I didn't know what she wanted. So we got to the line and she said it. And what's so, it was the first take. And what's so magnificent about that moment is that after she said it, she did a kind of an embarrassed laugh, which was Madeline because she was embarrassed. And it, it was gold. She had nominated, she should have won. Tatum won the Best Supporting Actress, and Madeline said, how come she gets the Best Supporting Actress? She's the star. I'm the supporting actress. <laughs> but, but Paramount wasn't going to put a Tatum up as the leading lady. She's nine years old. I mean, <laughs> didn't think that would work too well. But that's that's that was happened. Well, Peter, something else that came up um, in all three of the films that you worked with her on, um, but first and foremost in What's Up, Doc, um, because that was, of course, her, her film debut, um, is that she did not like how she looked on film, and that plagued her forever. Um, that's true. And how? So how did you... Well, we didn't try to make her look good. That's one Right. Of the, in What's Up, Doc, she was supposed to not look very good. She had that wig she had to put on and so on and so forth. And uh, that was the part. Madeline was an attractive woman. We didn't, we, we didn't try to make her look good. That's the problem. We sort of let her look not so good. And in Paper Moon, she didn't like the way she look, looked in that either. And that was black and white. It wasn't that, that flattering either. And then we did a long last love with Sizzle. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Available downstairs. <laughs> That's the good cut. And um, she, she she looks great in that picture. It's a it's a Valentine's my last love photo. Yeah, I think she looks great she in that picture. Phenomenal. But she was very, very uh, nervous about playing scenes with Sybil because Sybil was a well known beauty and uh, had been on the cover of Glamour about 10 times and Madeline was very worried about it. And I said to her, don't get a tan. Of course she got a tan. <laughs> because she thought I was trying to say that to make her look not as good as Sybil or something. Sabotage. So I saw it, it was crazy, but uh, she got a tan, which was the worst thing she could have done because she had freckles and they all came out and Lazo said, how am I gonna like this? <laughs> and anyway, she still looks good in the picture, so. And she was wonderful. All those, all, uh, the picture was much maligned when it came out, probably justifiably because it was a bad cut. But we now have a good cut of it, 35 years later, or something, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and there's some scenes in, that are in this that were not in the original cut. Madeline is great in the, in the big picture. She does all her numbers were done live without a cut. And Sybil as well always did all the numbers. We, we, everybody did all the numbers as though they were Rogers and, uh, and Astaire, you know, and they weren't. But that was sort of the joke of the movie that nobody was brilliant, except I must say Sybil and Madeline were brilliant singers and they did a great job. Um, the movie, for those of you who don't know, is Cole Porter music, and um, one of the things that makes it, um, I, I, I'm, to say extraordinary sounds like I'm sucking up, but um, special, um, is that the singing, unlike in most Hollywood movies, uh, the singing was not recorded, and then they didn't lip sync, they sang on the set, um, and those were the takes that, that, that Peter wanted. Um, so it gives the, well, I the, wanted to feel... Uh, Ex, ex, like they were making it up as they went along. But I didn't want it to feel stagey. I didn't want them to have to worry about matching what they'd done in the studio. And 
I just wanted it live. And uh, the, the best example of that, actually, is with Sybil and Bert Reynolds, who couldn't say it, but did a good job anyway. Um, they're in the pool, and he had a nose clip on it, like he couldn't swim. And Sybil pulled that clip, and it hit him right here. <laughs> and it really hurt him. <laughs> and she started laughing like that. <laughs> and Bert laughed as well. And I kept, and they're trying to sing through that. That was glorious, and that's my favorite. While moment. the water is splashing. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. It's a tremendous achievement. If I could just please. Jump in. The uh, technique that you used uh, in At Long Last Love, as we all know, was invented by Tom Hooper for Les Miserables a couple of years ago. Uh, and as we know from hearing him, uh, that was never, ever, ever, ever done before. And uh, he originated it, he invented it, and he's either an idiot or he's lying. He's a fraud. Well, and I'm saying that in Hollywood. All the, all the musicals in the early days of Simon, in the early days of talking, starting in 1929, with Ernst Lubitsch's The Love Parade, which was the first all talking, all singing, all dancing musical, with a book, a book musical, and 1929, and it was all live. So when Maurice Chevalier sings, Paris, please stay the same. That's him singing right there with the band off camera. We couldn't afford to have the band off camera. <laughs> so we had a guy playing a, a piano off camera with the horn turned off, and the actors had a little hearing thing in their ear that they could hear. It. Uh, Matt, Mildred Natwick said it sounded like grasshoppers <laughs> in their ear. But the actors did it. I don't know how they did it. I saw that when I looked at the film recently. I said, how the hell did they do that? How did you do it, Sybil? How did you do it? Well, Laszlo, where did he put the camera? He considers this his masterpiece. Because he Laszlo shot- Kovacs is the yeah. director of photography. Yes, I mean, you cannot find the camera. How in the world, where did he put it? And he, there was a documentary done on Laszlo a while back, and I was working with the man that was doing the documentary, and, I, and he said, well, Laszlo kept saying this is his masterpiece. And I said, why didn't you put that in the documentary? Because this is, in a way, his masterpiece. Well, it was, he did a great job, mm -hmm. because we had so many scenes which we did without a cut, a whole song, mm -hmm. through three rooms. The opening scene, the opening uh, song that Madeline does, comes in the door and then she goes over and walks around and walks to three rooms and out on a balcony. No cut. And she sings Down in the Depths in the 90th floor wonderfully. That was not in the original release, so you can imagine how bad that original release was. Anyway. Well, Sybil, you also, you're quoted in the book as saying that you thought the film was a matter of masterpiece. Um, yes. And they, well, she had a lot of masterpieces. She was brilliant at everything she did. But this was with the great cinematographer who made her look so glamorous and so beautiful and so funny. And that first number in the, de in the depths of the 90th floor, you just, it's astounding to me how good she is. You cannot find the, you forget the camera. That's what happens, you forget that there's a camera. And I got the title of that song wrong every single time in the book, and I didn't discover that until the day it was delivered to my doorstep. Um, yeah. What did you call it? Down in the dumps. I don't know. Why. Oh, no. I'm sorry. Oh. I feel I failed you. Um, but one of the uh, a couple of the doors that Madeline had. Cole, Cole, Cole Porter will write you a note. Exactly. He'll be after me now. Well, he's a yell man. What does he know? Uh, my my point would be that. Uh, Two of the numbers that uh, Sybil, you are in with Madeline are among the most challenging. Friendship is all six of you in a car, mm -hmm. and the camera is constantly moving without blocking the person who is singing. How the hell did that happen? And uh, most gentlemen don't like love. You're in the uh, ladies' lounge at Lord & Taylor. There are mirrors everywhere, and the camera is constantly moving, and we never see the camera reflected in the mirrors. It's astonishing. That was tricky. <laughs> <laughs> that number, in fact, it's worth looking up. It's it's Sybil and Madeline and Eileen Brennan dancing to most uh, gentlemen don't like love. Most gentlemen don't room. like love. They yeah. just like to kick, kick it around. Just like to kick it around. <laughs> so true. <laughs> there's, there's the three girls are so great. In that yeah. My well, favorite number, I think, besides the one that Madeline and Sybil do together, walking through what was supposed to be Central Park a song called I Loved Him But He Didn't Love Me, which I have to tell you was the first scene I wrote in the picture. That song gave me the idea for the whole movie. 
And when we were in Rome shooting Daisy Miller uh, with Sybil, uh, I wrote that scene where they talk about the two guys, and then they sing that song. And that's the first thing I wrote in the picture. <laughs> And it was cut from the first release. So but here, how bad this was. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and Madeline does it wonderfully, and Sybil does it wonderfully. It's a beautiful song, and it's a great arrangement by I think Gus Levine. It's uh, really, really my favorite scene in the picture. Well, Peter mentioned something uh, that takes us um, quite nicely into uh, the next stage of Madeline's career, which is the Mel Brooks years. Um, he mentioned her aversion to the word tits, which some of you may be surprised by because in all of the Mel Brooks movies, um, vulgarity is not, you know, hinted at. It's quite, quite, quite present. Um, and it's really interesting um, that uh, a woman who was nominated for an Oscar for playing Lily von Stupp um, <laughs> actually um, has uh, some real concerns about uh, being proper and dignified in the way she presents. And Bill, I was hoping you could speak to that a little bit. Uh, sure. Uh, I mean, I think there are a number of things going on with the Brooks movies uh, that are very important. One of the most important things to know about Madeline is that she was more hung up on her looks than almost any other actress. And the reason I found was that when her father <laughs> walked out, she was three years old, she had chicken pox. And she chased him to the door shouting, are you leaving because I'm ugly? So she comes to Peter and first she plays Eunice and then she plays Trixie and then she is standing next to the legendary Shiksa goddess, one of the great beauties of the 1970s and the 2000s. Do you think Shiksa is really a nice word? <laughs> My, my Jewish foster mother uh, would tell me that it was absolutely necessary. But it's not a nice word. <laughs> with goddess. With goddess. Goddess shakes okay. still. Blonde hey, goddess. Hey. Then she goes to work with Mel Brooks, and in High Anxiety, Mel makes Madeline look like Sybil, which is a pretty cool thing. Uh, but... I'm oh, sorry. What's kind of impossible. <laughs> and I don't mean that in any derogatory, derogatory way. I'm mm -hmm. just saying that simply she had her own beauty, a very unique beauty. Mm -hmm. But and she didn't uh, see that. You did. I understand. I did. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I was. I think of telling me, "Pretty is as pretty does." Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. sometimes I wasn't so pretty in my doings. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. one of the things that is really striking in the Brooks movies and in my conversations with Mel Brooks, he will insist. <laughs> to his last breath, that what he did was liberate her vulgarity. And she insisted with her last breath that no, that was his. And that she was just helping him to fulfill his vision. Uh, and you can't tell him otherwise, and he's wrong. <laughs> it really is fascinating to watch somebody embrace it with such a plum um, who really had personal resistance to it. It's, it's like finding out that Dixie Carter, who played Julia Sugarbaker, is in fact a Republican. It's very confusing. Um, but, uh, but that's acting. Um, uh, immediately following the, the, the Brooks movies, Madeline makes what should by, um, uh, on paper have been a, a terrific triumph on Broadway. She, um, takes on the role of Lily Garland um, in the Cy Coleman musical on the 20th century. Um, and it is a madcap musical that asks Madeline to draw on everything she's got. Incredible uh, uh, comic timing, zaniness, operatic singing, uh, uh, just it's, it's an incredibly challenging role. Um, and Maris was in the company of On the 20th Century. Um, what actually happened to Madeline was uh, during rehearsal, um, she was very, very scared of it um, and had a lot of trouble and ultimately um, left the show um, two months after, after opening. Um, but, well, I wasn't gonna say fired quite yet. I was gonna leave it to Maris. Um, but Maris, what can you tell us about, about Madeline during that and the experience of working with it and watching it? First of all, I enjoyed it tremendously. She was a lovely woman. Uh, secondly, she, at first I thought she was a snob. I didn't, oh, um, I didn't get that, um, that she really was trying to hold it together. And that's why she didn't speak to us backstage, because she had to concentrate so hard on getting out there. Um, there was a number called Together, 
and the show opened and had this huge <coughs> opening and then we, we were on the train and Madeline and John walked through. John Cullum was her co-star. John Cullum, sorry. And uh, what happened was I saw abject fear in her eyes and I happened to have had panic attacks myself. So I thought, oh, this is this is really bad. And because um, I thought now she's got the whole show to go through and it was a huge weight, we knew that. And uh, I really felt sorry for her, but I didn't feel like I could talk to her. So um, one night, somehow I got pulled with a gaggle of people and we were in New York and we went over to her apartment and uh, Robert Klein lived next door. And she said, she called Robert, come over and sing, sing for us. And so he, he sang, he made us laugh, we were all drinking. Whatever the rumors are about her doing cocaine, I don't know where anybody got them, but I know who was doing coke and it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so uh, anyway, we were having a great time, but at that point I felt like I could talk to her. She was being really nice and looking me in the eyes. And she, I said, Madeline, I, I wanna tell you something. I, I think you have um, panic disorder. It turns out I was a therapist later, so um, <laughs> that, that I started early. Uh, and um, she said, oh, oh, do I? And there was something in what I'm hearing in what you all say about her not knowing that she was funny. I think she knew she was funny. And I think she knew she was scared to death. And I think that all of that was there and what she would present that way, like, oh, do I? Oh, I didn't know. And so at the time I thought, oh, she really doesn't know. And I thought I was the person who cracked the nut. And um, I have to say, Mrs. Primrose is a nut, if anybody knows the show. <laughs> so um, I, thought, I thought that at that point that happened, but she knew exactly what was going on. And um, the other time we went out, uh, one story that was fun was we went out and high anxiety came out. And so she went to some Upper East Side show and there were three of us with her. Uh, and we went to see the movie and she got us in for no money. And they kept saying, why do you think you get in? She said, oh, no, I'm not all car. So we went in and we laughed and we were having such a good time. And we came out and went to some greasy spoon after afterwards. And some woman came up and said, are, are, you, are you that con woman? Are you, you know, the con woman? And she said, what? I don't, I don't know. Again, the total innocence. And she said, no, you know, Mary, Mary Methuselah, whatever her name was. So then Madeline said, oh, no. Somebody else said Madeline. She said, no, no, I don't know that. And then Madeline thought, oh no, my nose is very different from hers. And the woman said, oh, you're right, you're right. <laughs> and then she, the woman never caught on. So I don't know, those are most of my Madeline stories. I like it, I like it. Walter Willison tells a story of when they were in Boston with Two by Two, a woman came up to Madeline and said, you're so much thinner in person. <laughs> and it took him two hours to talk her off the wall. <laughs> Yeah, well, um, people can be so kind. Um, <laughs> um, as Bill uh, mentioned before, Madeline was fired from the show. Hal Prince was not in her camp. Um, uh, but a really interesting thing, you can listen to the cast album of On the 20th Century, and which was recorded the week after the show opened, and never know that anything was wrong because the performance is flawless. And uh, on opening night, as Bill reports in his book, how Prince came rushing backstage because she'd been holding back during rehearsals and during previews and trying to find her way. Judy Kay even says about her, she was giving away the performance. Um, but uh, opening night, she delivered. And how Prince came running backstage and said, there it is. That's what I wanted. That's what I've been trying to get out of you all this time. It's perfect. And she said, you don't expect me to do that every night, do you? And that pretty much sealed the deal. Um, so. Um, Yes, insecurity is a terrible thing. Um, but uh, Robert, we come to you because um, when uh, Madeline and Robert worked together in Santa Fe, um, where he directed her, as, as, as um, Bill said earlier, in the Kafka musical America and then in Blythe Spirit, it was sort of um, recovery. It was rejuvenation from, from being scarred from on the 20th century and being able to perform in a space that felt out of the New York glare and safe. Um, yeah, she definitely, that's why she wanted to do it. Both of us had fr mutual friends who um, 
ran this theater in Santa Fe and were just getting started. And the two of us went there together to work together. And we had been great friends for a while. We met through Gilda Radner years before. And um, we, uh, she was very relaxed in Santa Fe. She had a great time. There were, she was always terrified. And any public thing made her terrified. By the way, I think she was beautiful. She was such a, she was so unusual looking and had such beautiful coloring and beautiful skin. She had this peachy um, complexion that was, she was really lovely looking and, um, but very insecure about her looks and very insecure about everything. But she was so at home in Santa Fe. We had such a good time and she's surrounded by so many loving friends. Victor Garber was there with us and Amy Irving and it was a bunch of us that were all friends from before. So she felt very um, safe. Um, but I think, you know, about on the 20th century and even in the work that I did with her on stage, I did a lot of benefits with her. We did a lot of benefit work together. We, um, she was always being asked to do, I'm tired. And she would always ask me to do it with her. Would, would watch me do it, watch me. And she was fantastic when she would do I'm Tired. But the truth of the matter is, even in the plays that I did with her, she was much better on film. She really came alive. There was, she, she didn't want to play big, which is what I'm sure Harold Prince objected to. She didn't play broad. She was very subtle. I'm sure Peter would, would agree. And she was so, multi-layered, you know. She could say a line, and it had all different nuance going through it. Her face would be doing one thing, her eyes would be doing something else, and her voice was always doing something else. As you said, she was wants to be the music. She never talked, she only sang. Yep. Everything she said sounded like singing. Um, and I think on stage, she never really, um, she, she never really came across as strong as she did in film, I think. Because I, I, I remember when she was doing Born Yesterday, and um, she was really having a hard time with that as well. I mean, she was great. She was always great. But film was really where she shined. She was so wonderful. Uh, you touched on something, actually, that we haven't covered yet. And Michael, this, I want to come back to you on this one because we talked a little bit about her preparation. Madeline, even though she was a um, great comic, obviously, um, she approached everything from uh, going for truth and really um, was very much a method actor, um, even though she was dealing with, you know, Mel Brooks' shtick. Sh um, and that's that's a really interesting dichotomy. Um, it's also one of the things. That, it's also one of the things that Harold <coughs> Prince objected to. A lot of people found it very difficult to reconcile. Yes. Uh, they wanted her to hurry up and be funny. Yeah, exactly. But you coached her big. through some of that. And I. Um, I worked on three of Peter's films with her, and also two of Mel's films, yes. beside other stage things and other TV things. But. Um, uh, yes, we worked on need and what she needed and uh, she might have said something other than what she was saying, but she was uh, full and that's what comes through. And uh, when I had musical comedy classes in New York, besides acting, um, she, she brought in Tired and we worked on that, and we worked on uh, the long last love. And, and the uh, hillside speech in Paper Moon, you coached her on. Oh yes, and, uh, not Paper <laughs> Moon, and got her uh, a nomination. Yeah, and uh, uh, I, I, I want to say too, but what Mara said, uh, she knew uh, that uh, she was funny, and she could sound uh, funny with a line, she did know that. And then her, her defense in a certain way was to say, why are you laughing? Mm -hmm. But there were a, a lot of, uh, there was a lot of pain about that. 
Yeah, well, and it sounds like also insecurity about are you laughing at me or are you laughing with me? Exactly. Mm -hmm. well, and uh, that's, that's very old. It's, yeah. it's very, very difficult to have uh, her Bernie, her, first, her father, her biological father, leave at three, and then uh, Hiller, who adopted her, then also divorce her mom. So when she was sixteen, yeah. Yeah, but it, uh, when you uh, when you look at uh, when I do, when <coughs> it's very difficult to read, and I'd have to keep on putting the book down because I I saw the the difficulty of being rejected by Hal Prince seven times when she auditioned for you know, a company, and then going into a uh, kind of a rejecting father mm -hmm. in Hal Prince and try to be comfortable with that, and that wasn't gonna work. Well, I do know that with Peter, at least, part of the issue with, you know, why are they laughing, why are they laughing, am I funny, was that for Eunice Burns in uh, What's Up Doc, Peter didn't read uh, Madeline. There was no audition, it was a conversation as if it were a job interview. Yeah. So she won Eunice as herself, and suddenly people are laughing at her, and she looks like a frump, and that's why she was calling her brother every night from San Francisco saying, is this really how people see me? Um, and so it's, it's not your fault, but um, <laughs> if, if you had given her a couple of lines to read, she might have approached it somewhat differently. Well, that's interesting. I, I rarely read actors. I didn't read Sybil either. Um, I don't believe in readings because they make you nervous and you don't really, you're not really yourself. But Madeline, uh, no, I didn't read it. We just talked for about 20 minutes. Yeah. I said, you got the part, and she was great. You know, the last time I saw her was in the Sisters Rosenzweig. Julie. You did with her. God, she was funny. And, you know, she got laughs with, that were not there. I mean, I, I was watching the play, and then she'd say something like, but, get a huge laugh. I said, that's not a laugh line. <laughs> and she gets laughs. So she, was, she, was, she had an extraordinary way of delivering words that made it funny. And uh, it was just an uh, innate talent that she had that she well, didn't have to work at it. It didn't seem to me. She just was funny. Because Julie was part of that process, she watched Madeline create the character, and she can kind of dispute. <laughs> oh, OK, you don't want to go there. Sorry. Sorry, we'll get there, Julia. I don't want to go there yet. Sorry. But um, <laughs> um, JD, um, I actually want, because chronologically speaking, oh, true, um, true. you are, are you're the next in line, but also you can speak to something. Um, JD, as, as you may remember, directed every episode of, of Madeline's first sitcom, Old Madeline. Um, and it was also, before Sisters Rosenzweig, the first time that Madeline got to live in a role for an extended period of time um, and really continue to explore it. Um, however, um, a real, we were talking about her method and the fact that she was a method actor and in that show, ABC was looking for Madeline to be this generation's Lucille Ball. Um, the red-headed comic who was getting a lot of physical comedy that was not her forte at all. Um, and there you are directing all. Yeah, we, we did a pilot that was based on a, <clears throat> a British series called Pig in the Middle, which was about a love triangle. And in a pilot, the normal television uh, pilot process, we work for about 10 days. Whereas when you go to series, you have a play a week in five. So we got to, we got to explore all the, all the nuances of her character. And then ABC said, we love your pilot. We'll buy it, now change it. <laughs> Which was not uncommon in, in the 80s, and probably even today. Um, so we, we then had to take a writing staff that was geared toward writing a particular genre and move it into Lucille Ball in the 80s, which Madeline was, although with the red hair work, that was about it. She didn't do physical comedy that well, nor was she comfortable doing it. And I, have an, I, I think this may be in the book, Bill, uh, I have an, an interesting story about the very first episode that we did for the series after we'd done a successful pilot. And in the first episode, they wrote Madeline in a complete tiger suit with makeup, a long tail. And that was how she was coming out in her first performance in front of a live audience, live audience. 
And uh, we're, we rehearsed the show, we camera blocked it, we're ready to go, the, the audience is in, the audience is warmed up. And I get a call on my headset from the stage manager who says, he's from Alabama, JD, she won't come out. <laughs> we, I need you over here, JD, she won't come out. I said, I'll be right down. So I go and knock on the door, and I won't attempt to do the voice, but I'll do the, the emotion. <laughs> I knock on the door. Yes. I said, Madeline, it's JD, may I come in? Yes. And I walk in, and there she is in her tiger suit, sitting on the couch with mascara running down the face. <laughs> and I sat down, I said, Madeline, what is it? I knew what it was. I said, Madeline, what is it? She said, JD, I thought I was on the love boat to the Mediterranean. And I find I'm on a banana boat to Nicaragua. <laughs> <laughs> well, I broke up. I just laughed. I'm sure she appreciated that. And she laughed too. She laughed through the tears. And I, that was the moment that broke that for her. And I said, after talking with her for a few minutes, I said, well, the banana boat is leaving and we're on it. <laughs> that actually says a lot because, as I said, you directed every episode. So establishing right then that you were in it together yeah. um, probably really helped. We were, we, were, we were aboard the ship no matter where it went. And Madeline would question things, rightly so. We would all question things. We changed the writing to work. But you cannot get around the block scene where Madeline does something goofy physically. That was the that was the final scene in every episode, and to convince her to get to that point, it was like we worked as hard as we could to change it. But this is what they bought. This is this is not what we sold them, but this is what they bought, and this is what we have to do. So, my week consisted of talking about the flaws in the episode, dealing with them, but then convincing her that we've gone as far as we could. It's Wednesday now. We got to do this in two days. So. Convincing her that I would support her, that I would do the best I could with what we were given. And she, she, when she committed, boy, she was there. She, when she had made the commitment, regardless of all the insecurities, when she made the commitment, she was full out. She was going to commit and play it to the hill. And all I had to do is to remember to cut to that face <laughs> after the joke, because she could build a laugh and I could keep it going for a minute or two just by cutting to her reaction. And, and it saved us in a lot of places. What years was that? 83, 84. 83, 84. Yeah. And unfortunately, um, so the, the show ran just under a full season. Um, and it ushered in um, a, a pretty much a decade of, um, of things not going so well for Madeline, doing shows that and movies that were not of a, up to par. Mm. And so when she got to the Sisters Rosenzweig and she was approaching her 50th birthday, um, uh, you know, she had reason to be nervous about her career. And then this massive triumph of a show um, that really, I remember at the time, just took New York by storm. I mean, it, it opened at the uh, Mitzi Newhouse Theater, which is a smaller theater at Lincoln Center off Broadway, and then moved to Broadway where it had a multi-year run. Um, Julie, tell, you were there, tell us. <laughs> I was there. Um it's interesting just hearing all of these stories because I only knew her for the last six years or seven years of her life. So it's fascinating hearing about all of this background. And when I met her, she was my idol. So it was very strange when we became close because I had to kind of leave that part of her aside and get to know her as a human being instead of this idol that I had in my mind. Um, but she, um, you know, you were saying that, that she, you know, the reason why you, you feel like she was better on film than she was on stage, because she but didn't want to be big. Was the but that was her biggest concern about that part yeah, I know. from the very beginning, was that she really didn't want it to be this stereotype she the, plays. The part was Dr. Gorgeous. And Dr. Gorgeous was lived in, in Dr. Gorgeous Titlebaum. Um, you've heard of Dr. <laughs> Ruth, uh, Dr. Peppa? I'm Dr. Gorgeous. She had a radio talk show. Um, thank you. Uh, she was she was a, a, a call-in um, psychiatrist or a psychologist whatever call them advice, advice. Um, yeah. and uh, and she was from Latham Mass was it yeah. from Massachusetts yeah. um, and um, and and you know came, was was um, concerned about being perceived as just a Jap just a Jewish American princess that was the stereotype she was fighting 
Yeah, so she did all of that work. She did all of that preparation that everyone else has talked about to really make sure that it was she was a real person, that Gorgeous <clears throat> was grounded in every way, that there was um, something very specific behind everything that she did. Not that she ever really did it the same because there was always something different in every performance, but um, she was amazing. And for me, it was my first real professional job. So I walked into a room with Robert Klein and Jane Alexander and Madeline Kahn, and you know, it was overwhelming. And uh, when we were at Lincoln Center, we all the ladies shared one dressing room. So, and that's a nice way to get close. And she and I, <laughs> I don't know, something happened. I think I, I became maybe like a niece for her, another niece for her. Um, and she was very protective of me. And then um, when the show ended, um, we sort of, uh, we, we, we remained friends, but um, I, she was seeing John and who she ended up marrying and, and they would take me out to dinner and then we went on a little vacation together and I had this beautiful, very personal, private relationship with her and um, it was very separate from her career, her um, identity as her a persona. Actress. Yeah, she was so private. I mean, when she told me that she was sick, I, I don't know, I was surprised that she shared it with me and then she really shared it with me and we went shopping for wigs together when she started losing her hair. Anyway. Um, I, I, one of the things about Sisters Rosenzweig that um, uh, I so appreciate when you look at the, the totality of her career um, is it's one of the few, in fact it's the only part I can think of after Paper Moon where she got to display pathos. Um, after all that comedy and all of that stuff that just made people laugh just when she said but, she suddenly got to break hearts um, in a way that was worthy of her and worthy of what she wanted to achieve. And she did. She, she did. She was, she was a beautiful actor. And um, she was a serious person. She was a really serious person. She was far more serious than, than any funny person that I know. She just wasn't... You know, she said, uh, Lily Tomlin says that in your book. She didn't say funny things. She said things funny. Yeah. And her voice, you know, the way that she did the thing with the thing, you know, that was like, it was like music. So she could just turn that on. And you could do more of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but she could turn that on. And, 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 and she did yeah. know how to use yeah. it. So I, I, I really sort did. of, I agree that I think that she did know that she was funny, but she wasn't funny, ha ha funny. She was just, she was like a piece of music. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, she, she, had, she, she could make funny noises. <laughs> we had a scene in Doc where she was reading a book called The Sensual, Sensuous Woman, A Sensual Woman or something. And I said to her, you don't like this book, okay? <laughs> So we rolled the camera and she went, eh, 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 eh. <laughs> she, she did something, I can't do it, but it was so funny. Just noises. <laughs> so later in the picture, she has to go up to find the Howard, she's given the wrong address and she goes up this rickety staircase and she opens the door and, what are you doing with Howard's rocks? <laughs> And the, they all start going toward her. And I said, just make noises. And she said, what kind of noise? I said, you know. And sure enough, she did. She said, ah, ah, ah. Hysterical. So she knew how to be funny if you just said, make noises. And they were funny noises. I was once with her um, we were having dinner. And that afternoon, she, uh, I can't do it either, but she had just been to Robert Maplethorpe's studio, <laughs> and he asked her to wait in the waiting room because she was going to go in and be photographed, and she didn't really know what he did. And she said, there were all these books, and she opened them up, and <laughs> she went into this surprise, <laughs> the kind of thing that she did in Young Frankenstein, which was really funny. Only the writers, I know Madeline had that. <laughs> I never gave the direction, just make noise. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, well, uh, I, we are, we, 
we're, we're, we're at an hour. I don't want to cut it off without opening the floor to some of you to ask our panel any questions that you might have. Um, so does anyone want to ask anyone individually or, or, or as a group anything? No questions. You're really. all remarkably uninquisitive. <laughs> yes, yes. She was on SNL. Yes. That experience seems kind of like the worst of all possible worlds. It's, it's not a film, it's not a rehearsed, you know, well rehearsed play. Well, her experiences were. Uh, you know, they started out well written, and then the next time not as well written, and then the last time she was on the show was terrible. Uh, but she had the advantage of some really wonderful material the first time. Uh, she was able to sing an extraordinary amount. I mean, nowadays it's almost impossible to find an episode that is as tailored to the performer's skill as her first appearance was. Uh, and then she also had the great <laughs> blessing of working with Ilda for the first time. Uh, and the work that they do together is beautiful uh, and cherishable. Uh, they have the Not For Ladies Only, where Gilda is Baba Wawa, and uh, <laughs> Madeline is Mawena Deutschland. Uh, and then there's also a just gorgeous scene where they improvise together uh, for just two little seconds, and it's done. The ice cream. Yes, the ice cream and the baby, and the parakeet. Uh, <laughs> and it's why we love both these women right there in this distilled dose. Uh, but yeah, the writing uh, was not as good the next time, and when she came on in 95, she was a replacement for somebody else, and the material she was given could have been performed by absolutely anybody with two X chromosomes, um, and it was not good. But you make an interesting point that the SNL appearances almost seem like they're created in a lab to not work for that kind of acting, um, and yet she... Uh, particularly in that first episode, excelled, showing that really she always could transcend her insecurities about them. Though you can see her discomfort in the monologue, and also in the second appearance, uh, it was Dame Edna Everidge's American television debut, and they said, here, Madeline, why don't you just talk to Dame Edna, and she had no idea what to do. She did have a background in some improv and uh, cabaret reviews and things like that, but nothing that would get her through, and her discomfort is palpable in that particular segment. Yes? An odd kind of question, but all of you tell the story of such tenderness and insecurity and vulnerability. How do you think she would respond to a gathering like this on her behalf and a book like this on her behalf? I think everybody else may be able to answer this better than I can, but I can tell her she'd be terribly embarrassed and she'd be furious with me for writing the book because I just spilled all of her secrets. But if anybody else has thoughts... Uh, we have microphones. <laughs> I have no idea how she would react to it. She'd probably make some noises. <laughs> I think that she... I really feel that she would love your being here. And she would be... Uh, embarrassed about many things. As I said, I had to, uh, the first time I read it, I had to put it down many, many times because it was uh, painful to, for me. There are reasons she would not have allowed this book to be written while she was alive. Yes, but I think that uh, so many friends and uh, other uh, people that I know, actors at the studio, uh, they would say, I loved her so much. And when I was carrying the book once, when I was going to uh, sit on a, a park bench and read it, because I didn't want to read it inside, so I read it, uh, and I was carrying it, and this fellow said to me, oh, Madeline Kahn, I loved her. I love her. Do you? <laughs> and I think that's... Uh, the feeling that uh, why many are here and many uh, could make it, let's say. I think that uh, she left uh, an incredible legacy of uh, beautiful work and feeling work. Yeah. And uh, that's what remains. And uh, I think she would love that. And still embarrassed to. Anybody else have thoughts about this? 
I think there was only one person that I spoke to for the book who was not an enthusiastic supporter of her, and even he admired her, but that was Hal Prince, uh, <laughs> who is still angry with her to this day. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think she would be absolutely amazed by how much love there was, and that was one of the things that brought me to write the book, was I happened to be watching her clips on YouTube, and for some reason I scrolled down to the comments, and every single one was, oh, I loved her so much. If you look at Judy Garland's clips, if you look at Maria Collis's clips, even Ella Fitzgerald, there's always going to be somebody who says, ah, she's not all she was cracked up to be. For Madeline, every single comment was exactly this kind of love. You know, I actually, I, I have a perspective on, on the Hal Prince comment, which was just in, in my book when I talked to Angela Lansbury about Hal Prince, she said he was not at all a director for actors. Um, and so, I can envision a scenario where he didn't understand her and still doesn't, Work didn't understand, process. right. Yeah. Work, yeah, uh, well, I was, I was just going to say one thing, and I'm surrounded by directors, so this is Maris. But what I saw about her was that she was so organic. And mm -hmm. when I saw her work, I said, oh, you're not supposed to do that in, in musical comedy. Because in opera musical comedy, you're supposed to do everything the same way every single night. And she chose not to do it. And I think, first of all, it threw one of the actors, I know Kevin Kleiner threw him off a little bit, but, um, but he went along with it and he could, he, he got with the program. But I think that's why Hal didn't like it because he did not feel in control. And, and, and other people who had never worked with somebody who was so organic, and that's why she was so wonderful and good. You got the tapes. That's but, what I Yeah, different, everything. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, yes. Did she have any actors that she uh, was that she was inspired by or she admired? Yeah, quite a few. Uh, I mean, uh, gosh, right off the top of my head, Carol Lombard uh, for comedy. Uh, probably some other people can give suggestions here too. Uh, she was not a big student of Marlene Dietrich, which is a surprise. Uh, but yeah, there were, she, John Moreau actually was one of her absolute favorites. And when she was in college, she actually tried to look like John Moreau. Uh, because uh, Lily Tomlin uh, has said that she also tried to do her hair like John Moreau. And I mean, that was what smart college girls did <laughs> in the late 50s and early 60s. Uh, you just had to be John Moreau. And then uh, she actually got to appear with John Moreau on The Tonight Show uh, in the 70s. So she got to live the dream. Just like me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have time for one more. Yes. Oh, I just wanted to ask. There was a joke made about her going into therapy. I just wondered if she um, ever was helped with that insecurity, or was she ever able to take in the love that people have for her, or did, or did this just was this just how she died? Maybe? I asked several people. Um, did she know? how people felt about her. And without exception, the answer was no. I remember vividly the day she died. I was working at ABC News, so I guess we got the, day, the news a little early. Uh, but then for the rest of the day, all over New York City, people were going, ah, I loved her so much. And you didn't have to ask. It was one of those things like when Warhol died. All of New York City said, I just saw him the other day. I had just seen him the other day, and I, no reason. Uh, but you didn't have to ask who people were talking about when they said, I loved her so much. And so I asked many people, did she have any idea? And the answer is no. I mean, therapy got her through the day. Because of her mother, she had to support her mother. She had to work. There was no question ever of not working. Uh, and so she found the resources just to keep going. And her sheer persistence is one of the things I admire most about her. But did she come to terms with the fact that she was beautiful? Did she come to terms with the fact that people did love her? Did she come to terms with the fact that if a fan walked up to her on the street and she wasn't like Lily von Stubb, then she wouldn't disappoint him. She was sure she would disappoint that guy, and so in fact she did not talk to fans on the street very often. But the idea that people would not be disappointed by who she really was um, was something that I don't think she could have accepted. I, I just want to say something because um, I, I hope we didn't paint a portrait of her as being this kind of depressed, repressed person. She wasn't. No, 
she was fun and she was incredibly lively and she had a phenomenal mind. She, we were talking about her and Gilda Radner. I was very close with both of them. And they were two women who had incredible radar. They could walk into a room and size up everybody in the room immediately. They knew who was interesting, who wasn't interesting, who was a phony. And Gilda's more playful. Gilda would be very playful. Madeline was more of like, get away from me if you're not somebody I want to know. Um, but she was a delightful person to be around. She was really fun. We, we had, she, when we were living in San Fe, they thought it would be fun for her. The, the guys who owned the theater, they were really sweet to all of us, but they gave her a house underground. I mean, she just kept saying, why would they take a Jewish girl from Park Avenue and put her in a house underground? She was living in this, play I don't know what they call that kind of a house. A yacht, a yacht, what do they call it? It's called the Pit House. She actually has, house. in her archive, there is a full page from an architectural magazine. It's based on a traditional native structure, and it is, in fact, underground. If you were to walk up to it, you wouldn't know that it was there. It looks like a hillock. You would have no idea this no house windows. Was there. <laughs> there were no windows. There was just this roof that was like a a, a sun, uh, you know, a skylight, and that was the only light that came in. And she would call every night. She said, "Would you come over and kill it? There were bugs all over the place. The spiders in the in the bathroom." But she didn't want to tell the guys that she hated it because. She thought they were doing something so nice for her. Yeah, you said that every conversation ended with, tell them I love it, yeah. hurry, <laughs> hurry. Yeah, <laughs> tell them I love it, don't, don't, tell, don't tell them. She, just, she was just really fun to be around. She didn't, she didn't, uh, she didn't tell anybody, uh, did she, that she was dying? Because I never, I just said, she, she told Julie. <clears throat> Julie was yeah. one of the first to know. But I didn't think she, told very many people because I never heard about it. I just suddenly heard She it. called me right. and she said, do you think if you get a diagnosis and you ignore it, it'll go away? She actually asked me that. Mm -hmm. She said, I think, you know, when they tell you something like that, if you just pretend it didn't happen, mm -hmm. and she said, it's better off if you never know, and maybe it'll just go away. Well, Maris mentioned Robert Klein. Uh, and I think it's interesting that you had that conversation when he was there. They worked together uh, for 30 years, including Sisters Rosenzweig, and they had known each other for a couple of years before they started working. Of all the people she knew, this was one of the people with whom she was most comfortable, and she didn't tell him. So that's a measure of... Privacy. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's a good place to, to, to end when we're talking about the, the character overall and the joy of Madeline Kahn because, of course, it is all captured here. Um, <laughs> and, um, all of it. All of it. Um, and this book is, of course, for sale today, and Bill will be here uh, signing. Um, so thank you all for being here, and thank you to our fantastic panel for coming out. Um, and uh, have a wonderful night.